Welcome back, Vault Hunters Dirch here, and today I wanted to talk about farming, but not in the same way I did in my last Borderlands 3 wishlist video. Um, more in the way of loot source farming. Borderlands 1 and Borderlands 2 did this in two kind of different ways, and it's a two-part problem. One part is actually the way that the gun parts work and kind of rarities, and the next part is actually looting. So in Borderlands 1, Endgame at least, a lot of your farming was pretty much Cromorax glitching through General Knox. That was pretty much Endgame for Borderlands 1. You know, just mobbing runs like a lot of people do in Borderlands 2 wasn't as big in Borderlands 1 for some reason. Uh, there was some at some point, but it, like the Crimson Armory for a while, and that was a big one just, you know, running through there and looting. It really comes down to those two things for a lot of people. They're both kind of similar, but when you uh, do Craw, there's such a big loot explosion and there's a bunch of legendaries, there's a bunch of different guns, and Borderlands 2 doesn't really have a loot explosion like that. And then the armory, you know, you drive forever because I hate Nox's driving, but some people like it. Anyways, <laughs> that's not the point. You go fight Nox and then you uh, glitch into his armory, and you just open a hundred chests and those chests have a really good loot chance and you find crazy good loot. And it is fun doing that. In Borderlands 1, some game, some guns had a dedicated loot source, but a lot of legendaries and uniques in Borderlands 1 did not have a specific source. They were just world drops. But on the other hand, it, a lot of times you just found them. I mean, some are insanely rare. They were crazy hard to find. But, you know, like a Hellfire, for example, I always just got a bunch of them just playing the game. Now in Borderlands 2, world drops are insanely rare and you almost never get them, but almost every item has a dedicated source. So you know, if you want a gun, you know where to get it. Now some of those are still easier to get or harder to get than others, but you have kind of this direct source to get that gun. However, which, which one's more enjoyable and better for the community? And that's tough. If I'm looking for a specific gun with specific parts, it might take me a while to grind that boss, but I can go get it. In Borderlands 1, I might never see that. Borderlands 1 can be less frustrating because you just find more stuff. Finding the balance between those is, is kind of the trick, and that's what I want to talk about. Now in the title of this video, you know, I compare it to record shopping, and actually before I get into that, I guess when I was, uh, I was in Mopey's Twitch stream, and... I was talking to a gentleman or gentlewoman, not sure the gender, but that's uh, irrelevant to a lot of exchange of ideas, talking about basically this topic. And, you know, Goat was more on the side of BL1, I was more on the side of BL2, but kind of got me thinking because, um, back to my record analogy, one of my favorite things to do is use record shopping. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm a massive music buff. I have, you know, quite a large collection of music just... Yeah, we'll just say that. <laughs> I think I have like eight binders of CDs still that are 420 each, so do the math, and hundreds and hundreds of records, and I have a big music collection. I like just tons of stuff, and one of the most fun things for me was to go to a used record shop and just start at A and flip through everything all the way to Z and see what gems I could find. Go there with no agenda and just find cool stuff, and that's kind of Cromorax in the armory. And that is fun. You just you don't go looking for a specific gun, maybe you just see what you find and you find some cool gems. That doesn't really exist in Borderlands 2. Borderlands 2 is more like I'm gonna go to a store with all new stuff and I'm gonna go looking for a specific thing and go take that off the shelf and buy it. And maybe it's super popular so they're sold out and I gotta go to three stores and it's kind of annoying, but I eventually get it. I honestly have more fun use record shopping. In Borderlands 2, there's two versions of that. There's the snowman and the loot midgets. But those don't really compare to Craw and Armory. How should Borderlands 3 be? First, I think we have to talk about gun parts. In Borderlands 1 to Borderlands 2 again, the gun part system's really different. And I like both systems for different reasons. Now, Borderlands 1, there's a lot that drives me nuts about it, but the better things are the fact that you can get legendary parts, not just barrels. So you can get your hybrid legendaries, which really increase the amount of legendaries in the game. Or unique guns in the game, not just legendaries, just unique guns. Because you can have a unique barrel, unique accessory, 
sights, I think grips maybe. Um, there's a lot of different unique parts. I, I'm a little rusty on that part system, so I don't know if it includes grips and stocks and everything, but there's a lot of unique parts to guns, so you can get, you know, multiple uniques to create a hybrid unique gun or a hybrid legendary. And again, that really opens the game up. On the other part of that is all the guns kind of feel the same to me. All the SMGs felt the same, they just had different stats. So some were like weaker and faster and some were more powerful and slower like thumpers, but it's still the same SMG no matter what brand it is. And that to me is kind of boring. And Borderlands 2, the guns had what people call their gimmicks. I don't like to say gimmicks because the gimmicks has like a negative connotation. To me, the brands were so much more well-defined in Borderlands 2 because, you know, shooting a Jacob's pistol to a Torg pistol is quite different. Jacob's shotgun to a Hyperion shotgun or a Torg shotgun to a Hyperion shotgun. They all felt so different brand to brand. Vladoff pistols to Torg pistols. You know, across the board, things just feel so much more different. So the guns, to me, the brands are so much more well-defined. It wasn't just stats, it's the way they fired. You know, TDR, you got your throw reloads. Hyperion, you got your reverse recoil. Vladoff, you got your super fire rate. Molly One's got their elements. Jacobs are the non-element and non-automatic guns. You know, Dolls got their burst fire. Like, they all, like, feel so unique. And that, to me, makes the whole system feel more unique. And the barrels are by brand, and all the parts are by brand. Where in Borderlands 1, a lot of it was, you know, you barrel like 1, 2, 3, 4, mat 1, 2, 3, 4. There's less vendor-specific stuff. And the ARs, it wasn't super successful in Borderlands 2, but the Torg barrel turned them into rocket or grenade launchers. Like, that's cool. I wish they would have got the stats right on it. It would have been cooler. But it's still, like really define Torg as a brand. In Borderlands 1, there's less of that. So I like both systems for different ways. And if they could hybrid these systems, um, bring us back legendary accessories, make these things a little more common on the world drops, and give us some of these loot explosions. Borderlands 2, when you kill Terramorphous, you get a lot of loot. It's a pretty big loot explosion. Maybe not Cromorax big, but it's pretty big. Problem is, within that loot explosion, you don't see many uniques. You'll get your kind of guaranteed uh, Terra Com. Even to get his loot stuff is pretty rare, and then you rarely see world drops. It's not the same craw excitement. And I think if they merged the gun system, so keep the individual way guns work. Like, I want Jacob's guns to shoot like Jacob's guns. I want Torg guns to be explosive. I want, you know, I want that stuff. I think that stuff is good. But if they could have a masher barrel, you know, maybe separate repeaters and revolvers, again, I would be fine with that. Or maybe like what they did in the patch is just, you know, Jacob's barrels, a revolver, maybe you need to change the bodies. I don't know. Bring back the masher accessory that, you know, change things up more. Bring back, you know, just legendary accessories. Like the Remington's Edge has got, I think that's the only one where I don't think it's on the barrel of the legendary. I think it's on the scope. It could be wrong. But, you know, give us legendary scopes. Give us legendary accessories. Give us legendary parts, not just barrels. In the Borderlands 2 kind of differentiating gun brands. And I think we got a win-win. And then with that, you can go back to your kind of like light orange, dark orange, kind of your degrees of legendaries. And, you know, again, I like the grips and the barrels to be vendor specific. And I kind of like them to double down what they did in Borderlands 2 a little bit. Like Vladoff has two AR barrels. You have your standard one and then you have your Gatling barrel. I'd like to see more of that because that, that stuff really, really, I think, changes it up more. You know, maybe Jacobs has got a masher barrel for revolvers. Maybe, I don't know. There's lots of ideas you can do with that. Maybe Tor gets a regular AR barrel and the grenade launcher, rocket launcher one. You know, there's there's a lot you can do with this stuff to kind of open it up more, make it more unique and more unique guns. And maybe those barrels are unique barrels. Who knows? But I, I think by merging the two gun systems is the win, and then you can kind of merge the two looting, because some people prefer the dedicated sources. You know, hey, I really want this gun. I'm going to be willing to put in the time to go find it there's a case for that but then there's like i just want to find crazy shit and see what happens we should have some loot explosions in borderlands so i hope they bring back the craw um i really wish like i think in borderlands 2 it would be much better if all the dlc bosses were repeatable and then you could go farm 
Because the loot room after uh, Jackenstein and the Hammerlock was a pretty decent loot room. But you could only do it once. Like, at least the Leviathan, you could go hit that up twice. If they would have just let us farm that stuff on repeat, you know, if someone wants to go kill the Leviathan and then go loot his room a hundred times, let him do it. Who cares? You know, same thing with Jack and Stein. Um, <laughs> he should have just fixed Badassosaurus Rex. That, that was terrible. That was the we weakest loot, loot explosion I've ever seen in my life. And then uh, the Handsome Sorcerer was pretty good. That was a pretty decent loot drop. I think they improved on that one a little bit. It seemed like more world drops were common in that. Kind of sharing the warrior's loot pool is kind of weak. I kind of get it, but at least it was a bigger loot explosion than a lot of them. You know, the warrior had a big loot explosion too. Kind of had that same problem. Like, you can get a lot of really solid stuff, but it's not like Craw. What do you guys think where you are on that? But I, I really just want both. I mean, I think both games had their merit, and I don't see why they can't just, like, come to the middle with them, both with guns and loot drops. And that way, everyone's happy. I'm going to go farm for a Liuda. We've seen, you know, Fiber doing it. I'm going to go to Gettle. I know where to get it. Or I just want to see a bunch of crazy shit. And the cool thing is that they keep the grinder and you get the loot explosions. And you pick up all those legendaries you don't need. You can go grind them to get something you do want. But the one worry is if they do the big loot explosions and you have the grinder, you kind of still have to keep them at sources just because if you make too many things world drops and you put the grinder and then people say that's the only way to get it, you can get into sticky situations. So there's kind of a fine balancing act of, you know, world drops and sources even if you include, include them both. That's that's a good balance, but, you know, that's what playtesting is for and hopefully they're doing that. But, you know, what do you guys want to see for all this? Let me know in the comments and Hey, you know, as long as I'm here and I was talking about used record shop, and I'll give you guys a nice little dirt story. So, High Fidelity is one of my favorite movies. I graduated high school in the year 2000, so you guys have an idea of my age and everything. And uh, about the time that movie came out. And, you know, being a music fanatic with that movie, obviously, it kind of means something. And uh, right after high school, I moved to Chicago, and Reckless Records is in Chicago. And that was the record store in America. It was based off of, I know, the book High Fidelity by Nick Hornsby is in in England, but the movie, they translated it to Chicago, it worked pretty well, I think, and yeah, so Reckless Records, I was shopping there one time, and I'm searching through A to Z, and I get to R, find Lou Reed, and they have a pristine, beautiful copy of Metal Machine Music. Now, if you guys love music, you should know what Metal Machine Music is. Now, I already had two copies of this on vinyl and one on CD, but I had to buy it anyways, because... When you find a gem like that, you can't not buy it. You know, it's like if you find a Leatherface album in America, you have to buy it. Even if you own like 10 copies of Mush, you have to buy the 11th. It's just too good not to buy. So I'm picking up my third copy of Metal Machine Music. And there's this like old clueless guy in line. And he's holding everything up. He's like, yeah, I called in. I had to, you know, have you guys put aside Kind of Blue for me, the Miles Davis album on CD. Now, if you guys aren't big into jazz or music, you might not know Kind of Blue. Kind of Blue is one of like the top five selling jazz albums of all time. It's insanely common. Like you can go to like Target and find it probably. Um, you know, Headhunters by Herbie Hancock is the most selling jazz album of all time. Kind of Blue is definitely somewhere in the top five. And this guy like goes to the specific like you know, kind of like downtown Chicago record store to buy like the most common jazz album of all time and put it on hold. And they had like 10 copies of it over in the rack, but he was like being stubborn and refusing to get all his way. So I started like getting into an argument about this guy, all music snobbery about like the stupidity of what he's doing. And it just kind of got ugly, but I kind of found it funny that I got in like a music snobbery fight with a guy because he refused to get out of line like in the store that high fidelity was based off of buying a third copy of metal machine music which is like the most pretentious fucking music purchase you can buy uh yeah it was kind of perfect and beautiful you music snobs or music fanatics will get a kick out of that everyone else will be like what the fuck is he talking about what a dick how dare you yell a guy for just trying to buy a cd but seriously you like kind of blue like first of all you should have it Second of all, just go to the rack and pick it up. Everywhere in America has it on their fucking shelf. Maybe not anymore because, you know, CDs don't exist like they used to. But 
back then, that was like before MP3s and stuff, everybody had kind of blue. Yeah. So anyways, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed my little snobbery story at the end. I've grown out of my music snobbery days, though. I am now a well-adjusted adult. Can't you tell? Um, I'll see you all later. If you have not yet subscribed, please do so. I appreciate that. I got a pizza on the way because I'm too lazy to go grocery shopping. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.